Hello, Molly. How are you doing? I'm fine. Hopefully this works. I know, right? Third time's a charm, right? But I'm so honored and so delighted to have Molly with me today. And I'm really happy to be speaking with you, Molly. And today we're going to be talking about some ideas related to a book that Molly recently read. So I'm going to let her go ahead and tell the title and author and just a couple of um, main points from it. And then we'll, we'll get going with the conversation. Yeah. So the book is called The Spell of the Sensuous, and it's by David Abram. Um, basically, he's like an ecological philosopher and he's trying to track our disconnection um, from the natural world um, in a philosophical way. Um, so it's basically has the sort of presupposition that it must be there must be almost like something to do with our way of thinking, with our deep philosophical preconceptions that um, that are of orientation to the world that allow us to behave so immorally in, in relation to the natural world and other species. Um, so that's basically like the premise. And then it goes into like language, um, sp- like theories of space and time, different things. But what I found really interesting about it was, it's called the spell of the, sensu- the sensuous. And the writer himself was like a magician and spent time like as a shaman in indigenous uh, cultures. And it kind of, the book itself kind of casts a spell, you know, it sort of, it, it takes you away with it to such a degree that you're sort of so convinced. And then when I left the book, I was like, I just, it was like, I'd been on a little journey, you know, I was like, I like any good book can do, but that's also part of what it's about it's about the magic of language and um as well so um so yeah it was really brilliant and I'm happy I'm happy to be able to talk about it with you oh wonderful I'm so happy to hear that Molly and I'm glad that you had this experience with this this book and uh it sounds like it was really captivating um and yeah I I think that's interesting too because you were traveling right you were in like a, a big city and like I think you said something about like how, you know, don't read this if you don't want to kind of feel a little bit alienated from, you know, from like a city or, you know, like a, a more kind of industrialized or quote unquote civilized type of um, uh, environment, you know, which I thought, I, which I thought was really, really interesting. And um, yeah, I think, I think that it's fascinating because like language dictates so much of our lives and mm. it's such a big part. And yet, like, if we really think about what it is, and how it even how it even operates there's so much about there's something that is kind of almost mystical about it uh, about the very nature of language itself because you know first of all like it is and it really starts to hit home when you think about different languages you know it's like why how is it that that sound for those for this t- group of people means this and like for mm. these group of people it means that like how, and yeah it's, or like it's the same concept but they have different sounds right to make those words and i i used to think about this even as a child like how did people get to those type yeah. things? And it's wild. It's just like, how? I don't even... <laughs> yeah. It's re- yeah, no, I was just going to say, he, he does track a lot sort of the connection between landscape and language and sort of mm-hmm. myth and language. Like, well, he doesn't track it that much. He more sort of alludes to it. Um, but I guess it is like, he, he talks about how originally language is this type of, like, he, he talks about as well like I think it's very appealing if you're somebody who's drawn to poetry because he says like the onomatopoeic nature of language is never lost like language is primarily um a, a sort of uh it works obviously it works on the sort of metaphorical a conceptual level very much now but it also works in a sort of direct sort of onomatopoeic way where it sort of mimics the sounds of yeah. what it's describing and he talks about um about that and you know also how it's so deeply rooted to a per- the particularity of a mm-hmm. of a landscape as well but i guess um the other thing about when i was traveling and stuff like that it's kind of weird because of this book sort of cast a spell like it was like well there were two things it was like um whether oh sorry actually i'll go into that later but it's basically whether like like because he's he's talking about the written word as being a type of spell itself as well as sort of the oral language but he wants to sort of stress that like oral language because it's embodied um and because it's um it you know because it it's it's more direct type of magic whereas the written word 
sort of um through the development of the written word which became phonetic or it began to reflect the human voice it became more abstracted from the natural world and less of a direct relationship over time mm -hmm. so anyway the point i just wanted to make was like it was kind of weird because i wasn't connecting to my surroundings because i was like fully engrossed in a book so it wasn't like i was sort of like oh because i had this like higher connection to nature or something it was more like I was just distracted by this book so it's like <laughs> and like all these ideas so it was like kind of different you know um mm. but yeah it is kind of weird it's sort of ironic that like it's written in uh, like as in this very intellectual way and it's kind of supposed to make it's called it's about the central world and it's about connecting with your senses and it's like he even talks about how how um you have to cut off so many of your senses in order to engage in the act of reading you know mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I love that. I love that so much. And it kind of presents a funny paradox, even in reading the book itself, right? Like you're saying, yeah. it's sort of strange sort of, it takes a book to it takes the book to sort of, like, almost cut you off for a little bit so that then you can way that would be deeper. And richer. yeah, um, but I think that's, right. I think that's very and and fine. You know, it's, it's not like a, mm. it's not like contradiction. I mean, honestly, like, no even the idea of contradiction is almost like that's not necessarily problematic because we can understand them as just happening in a in a different like a kind of timing and it's like with sleep you know we we sleep and we go to like this land of the unconscious but it it takes all of from the day that then kind of filters into our unconscious and then we sleep and then we wake up again and like the two sort of have a dialect with each other right they inform mm, each other in different yeah ways. of course yeah. Like, yeah, no, that's we, really interesting. I like yeah. I really like that parallel. Yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank um, you. Yeah, I think that's I think that's what we I think that's how I at least see books. Like because mm. I like I understand that in a way they're kind of an escape. But they can be. <laughs> yeah. But, but at the same time, like is sleep an escape? You know, we have we have a programmed mm. almost biological escape every day. Um yeah. and, and that's like part of our recharge and our reconnecting. Yeah. In, in like that then actually it's like a it's this term that I have thought about and I haven't really fleshed it out very well but I had mm. done like some short recording on it but I don't think I ever published it but there's this mm. idea of kind of the the rest connect oh I also wrote a little poem on it yeah so anyways mm. it's like the idea of rest connect where it's not mm. simply I think we have like and this kind of goes on a different direction so I won't talk too much about it but yes. I want to just touch on the fact that rest is I think it's a it's kind of can be misunderstood, you know, like yeah. rest is not merely sleeping. It can mean that like, don't yeah. get who doesn't love a good nap. Right. Yeah. But there's also something deeper to it. Cause I think there's something right. about what are the things that you can connect to or the people you can connect to that actually recharge your soul. And right. you know, what are the things you do or the things you can create that really mm. restore you. And I think as people who maybe are, have more of a, uh, creative drive it, mm. it's weird because sometimes you actually feel more tired when you haven't done as much with your creativity right. which is a very weird irony because it's like well if you're tired shouldn't you just want to do like absolutely nothing but you really yeah. kind of you feel almost tired because it's like a weightiness of all the things yeah. you haven't gotten out you need to get it out right 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 yeah you that's know? interesting yeah, 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 yeah. So i think that's really fascinating to me so i think there's something this mm. about this idea of rest connect and how sometimes there's this oscillation between alien, kind of quote unquote alien, alienating ourselves, but it's also in, it's actually to be able to connect in a deeper way when we are not in that little phase of alienation, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, no, um, I'm just trying to like process all of that. Like it's, I know, I like the one thing that I, I, I was thinking of when you're speaking is just like, yeah, like somehow like I like I guess it's like um this idea of like preparing or or sort of like dreaming as a sort of um preparing for the waking life and there's like this sort of like like I've noticed for example when I dream of a place and then I visit it like subsequently like I feel such a much like a, such a huge like presentness when I'm there because I've dreamt of it hmm. and like um but I guess, like, with dreams, um, I guess, like, what he's trying to say is that, like, obviously with, like, the unconscious and with dreams and with these types of things, they, like, that's a type of logic which, which is very fundamental. And 
there's there he's tried to track some transitions which happened with like quote unquote civilization, mm. which mean we're in the place we're in now. And language is a form of technology that has like because it's phonetic, um, which means it reflects the sounds of the human voice rather than the natural world, which it used to. It is kind of like a mirror sometimes rather than a direct relationship. Now, yeah. I love language. Like, I, I really do. And I love books and reading. But it, So it was interesting to hear this. But, um, but yeah, so it's like, obviously, there can be types of technology that do disconnect us from that type of, like, I feel like dreaming and landscape and, like, that's, you know, that's something very fundamental. I don't feel that is a type of detachment that's a type of connection a type of preparing and tracing of the world around you but but sometimes like as human beings we can orientate ourselves away from that connection and language can be a means to doing that as well so I think it's important to to note that you know that I'm because like you even notice it yourself like if you're out in nature for a walk or something like I I had this really badly after my philosophy degree that I did at my undergrad <laughs> like I couldn't experience the world as it was like I had done all this analytical philosophy and stuff and like it was just like I just was trapped in language you know mm -hmm. so that's why this stuff really resonates with me because it's like I had to find ways of getting beyond it get kind of throwing away the ladder like Wittgenstein mm -hmm. says where you sort of you get to the bottom or the top of philosophy in a way and you find this mystical sort of uh, uncanniness, like this sort of unknowability. And then at that point you say, well, okay, now I'm going to re-enter the world of things <laughs> and like with a renewed sense of wonder and beauty. But it's like during that process, it can be very arduous and, and you can get stuck at different points, you know? Mm -hmm yeah no I love that I love that thank you so much for sharing Molly and yeah I think I think that you're quite right there's this strange tension that language itself holds where it is in a way able to be magical and communicate like magically communicate something that's inside of ourselves that we then express and other people resonate with or or it's not always smooth you know it's not always received the way we maybe intend it or whatever um so yeah. language is a very interesting uh but you're right that it's there there is something about language that um it's almost like we now we have to use it right like it's almost like it, it, you know there's a way in which nature, like there could be some sort of existence and, and communication and even relation without it without language as we know it which is ultimately kind of a it's a symbol it's kind of a token and a technology like right. you said, which, mm. which represents something it's not the thing right. in itself it's not right. the thing in itself and yeah. nature, nature seems to kind of want to strip us away or at least like it, it, like something I think about nature a lot because I love nature. I live out in the country and um, I never really thought I would like live on a farm one day when I you know <laughs> grew up. But here I am. And uh, I, I, I think what's fascinating to me about nature is like I just think like I love her honesty, uh, mm. but I also love her mystery because there's so much that she reveals and conceals at the same time. Right. And I think that like something though about nature is that it does strike me though as just being able to bear itself like it's like it's just I am here I am this is this is me basically like mm -hmm. for some reason nature always feels very like honest and open about itself because it doesn't really because it can't like explain itself right it can't right. defend itself it doesn't because mm. it doesn't speak yeah you know, that we speak with language and yeah. so I always I kind of like if I'm honest there's something that's often made me feel like I know this is kind of silly perhaps sounding but like there's almost you know, and I'm happy to be human because I think there's something quite transcendent like about humans in their sort of hybridness that I t talked to you about in, in our like our messages. But yeah. like, you know, this divine human mix. But right. um, but there is something that th that's almost like, man, I wish I could be more like nature sometimes, you know, right. because, you know because it's just yeah. like it doesn't it doesn't have it doesn't seem to have the preoccupations and the worries and the the sense of needing to like explain or secure things with language within mm. its relation to itself and to uh, to those around it or it's yeah it, the relation that it has it's in its own. yeah so, so anyways those are some things that come to mind and i think that's right. that that is what makes language both like an angel and a demon right it's both like right. it's both good and bad it's yeah both. <laughs> no it's really interesting as well because like i like just your characterization of language like as a type of representation mm -hmm. though as well like 
that's something that comes up in the book in a certain sense as well, because he's saying that the reason language can be magic is when it's not functioning, like almost when it's not functioning in a sort of way of pinning things down, more like primordial language is like bird song. It's like mm-hmm. when you see kids like, doing those little songs they made up themselves like (laughs) and they're just they're just doing it for the joy of it like there's no it's not like they're trying to represent something they just want to participate with the world (laughs) around them Mm -hmm. and it's not it's not like it's just like it's in their bodies it's an expression of like joy even like the happy birthday message you sent me that's what I'm thinking of now (laughs) but um but um no but like it's just it's you know it's very um so so that's what he talks about is like how language is is this spell because and I feel you feel that as well when you participate in language it's like the moment of language when it's really meaningful you know is when it it it's almost like it channels something from the world around you you know it, it's like it's like you're and and that's like in like nearly every ancient belief is like that you can channel like the energies of the universe through through song through words yeah. so I find that really fascinating but also the other thing I was going to say was yeah well it reminds me slightly of like um you know Heidegger has this idea that like to secure in place as having set in place like he talks mm-hmm. about representation as this type of capacity within language to view things as clearly with clearly defined boundaries as sort of in a sort of atomistic way and that this is basically He's basically very critical of it. So I, yeah, so I guess it's like, it's like, what is language? Like, how can we make it, how can we use it? Like, or how can we embody it in better, more fruitful ways? Um, or if that's possible, like, as well, the other thing I'd love to talk to you about is technology, because I feel like it's like, he, he talks about one of the things he says, sorry, I'm going to stop ranting now. But, no, um, no, please go on, go on. I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. And one of the things he talks about is how, um, because basically he talks about Merleau-Ponty and this idea that like, you know, as well as us perceiving the world around us, the world around us perceives us. Like it's, it's this kind of illusion that we're sort of the only ones who perceive. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, but he talks about how, the bird song, because we've become so technological, um, even the bird song has like begun to diminish and like no longer is able to be like a full embodied like expression of glory or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. And, um, and like, I find that really interesting because it's like, where does technology leave us? Like, I like, it's like the idea that the Eskimos have a thousand words for snow. It's like, it's not just, but what I find interesting, it's not just the words that are changing. It's not like the vocabulary that's changing. What if it's the very mechanisms of thinking? What if it's the very syntax, like the semantics, like the very way the language relates to itself that's changing with technology, you know? So yeah, so then that's just like a little question mark uh, yeah at the end of my speech but yeah <laughs> no I love that that's that's wonderful I love that Molly and that's a really really good question and it's a hard question I I as I contemplated as you were speaking it's it does put my it makes my brain feel like an, in a bit of a conundrum to think about like what exactly is the almost the feedback loop of language to itself unto itself Ooh. because of technology and I do wonder if if there's just there's this idea that maybe we attune our ears to certain things that we grow accustomed to which tend to be things that maybe like are convenient or Mm. benefit us i'm not that's not necessarily bad there's risks there's risks to that but a lot of times it's just kind of an it's a almost a psychosomatic survival skill of just you know wanting to make sure we optimize our our attention on the things that we like we feel are are beneficial to us because ultimately we a lot of times what we do is like undergirthed by that like very primitive you know need to survive and Mm. and you know desire to survive and um and then also like we desire to thrive like i I think that right the side note this the connection between survival and thrive thriving is like very interesting to me um right but actually like one of the uh yeah, like sound, sound itself is is a particularly interesting um, kind of sense to consider because it's like 
you know, it, and, and, and like, I know that the, it sounds like the book wasn't speaking specifically about hearing, right. Or listening, mm-hmm. but it, it does seem to be that like, if we're talking about spell and spelling and language, mm-hmm. it's going to be particularly for our ears. However, right. we live in a time where, yeah, there's a lot of like video footage and audio and things like that. But mm-hmm. man, do we do a lot more like we do a lot more language reading with messages and yeah. articles online and, you know, all of that. Like we mm-hmm. do a lot of, you know, this reading of language versus hearing of language. Yeah. Um, because we also just don't have an oral tradition. We don't have an oral tradition right. for like passing yeah. down stories or mythologies or narratives, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I, I do wonder about that because it makes me wonder if kind of like with, with your point on the, on the, and maybe this again would be too basic, but just even uh, that's such a good example of the Eskimos that have so many words for snow or like, you know, or the color white or like they, they there's like so many, there's such a breadth of it that they can mm. see constantly attuned and attentive to that. And so I, it does make me wonder, like, what are we not hearing, right, in right. that we suddenly can hear because of the, you know, the connection to the quote-unquote World Wide Web, you know? Yeah. And it's, um, no, so it's, that's, yeah, it's really fascinating to think about that. Like, it's a hard question, but those are the thoughts that come to mind initially. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I think, like, I read an interview with this writer as well, like, after reading the book, mm-hmm. and he actually said, like, he thinks it's a bad thing to give children not only to give children technology from a young age but even to get to give them stories to read you know he oh, thinks wow. rather than read the stories the parents should tell them the stories or mm. and like they should hold the stories in their body mm. um so that I mean you can agree or disagree it's just it's interesting I had like because I think a lot of people would say oh no we shouldn't have phones but might not agree about the reading aspect you know but I guess with both of these type of technologies it's like they're he like he kind of believes they're such a powerful form of magic that they as you were saying what are we not hearing they kind of drown out Mm -hmm. other quieter more subtle ways and like I think that's so true like for a lot of people it's like you know and and that and it's just it's not they don't feel connected to the world around them like Mm -hmm. um but in the sense of the, the natural world, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I was just going to say, I, like, I find that the other thing about sound and voice is like the whole idea of attunement. Because um, he uses that word a, a lot of, in, the, in the text. Mm. And it's kind of like, I find that is a really nice kind of, like, obviously it functions like in a metaphorical as well as kind of literal way. But he gives um, an example of the Aboriginal people um, telling a song line Mm. and when they were there's a story of like some sort of account of like um a sort of western australian who um i'm not sure how you describe like the i don't know a white australian i guess i'm not Mm. sure how you describe that but Mm -hmm. um anyway he was like in a tractor and driving it and there was a like an indigenous person like in the um tractor with him and he started reciting one of the song lines when they got to a particular location. But because they were driving in a tractor, he was going like as really, really fast, like faster than he, he usually like would speak. He was like, he was going like 100 miles an hour. Yeah. And it's like, um, and then like the driver realized what was happening and like slowed it down to a walking pace. And then he started speaking at like a more of a like comprehensible speed. Mm. But like, it's just really interesting because that just shows you the depth of, attunement it's like you like depending on the speed that you're walking in the natural landscape that's how appropriate it is to um you know to speak at a certain speed and so on and I guess it's like yeah with technology it's like I don't know like that's our landscape now so (laughs) and it obviously goes very fast I'm not really sure like I I don't really know but I do believe in like I guess I believe in the miraculous. So I kind of think that like lots of things sneak through, like, you know what I mean? Like, even if you have technologies, they're never closed, Mm. like to like the effect of a sort of, of grace. Like Mm. in our voice notes before you were talking about the Holy Spirit, like I I believe in grace as well, like Mm -hmm. something external that sort of helps or sort of illuminates and guides and, um, I believe that like it's more powerful than 
any of our technologies, any of our distractions. So therefore, it can kind of permeate through them mm. and sort of, you know, help us in some way. So, yeah. but that's just kind of like my mystical faith. Yeah, yeah. No. That was all really good, Molly, and and that was really great. And I I, I really love that um story you told with like the pace of the the man speaking, kind of like almost syncing up with the tractor and the and the miles per hour, right? Versus like moving through space at a slower pace and how that would impact speech and sound. And mm. I I it makes me think like two things came to mind. Well, three. But so let me see. I hope I can recall them all now. But but the one thing was um that I want to remark on was about the children with technology and books. And I thought that was very interesting, um, really interesting too, because mm. a lot of times we kind of think as like, like there's, I feel like there's always been the question throughout the ages, especially for the caregivers and, and parents of children of like, mm. are we, are we taking, like, is it, are literally like, even think of um, colonial games, like the hoop and stick, right? Where like the kids just sort of, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that game, but it's a very, it's a very uh, traditional colonial game that mm. I see in like you know where they do um you know if you go to a town that's a historic town in, in colonial town in America they often right. have people who are like reenactors and like the they're you know th so you'll see these types of games and where and all of that and um you know for them you know parents may have even had a concern then like does does that take children away from like quote unquote reality or the real world mm. uh, or or like books like oh my yeah he knows in a book like you know he should be <laughs> learning how to like plow the land more or, or whatever right. and, yeah. so, and like so now we have the technologies of of the phones and screens and things like that and it's another question mark for parents and caregivers like mm. oh gosh does this like it, you know what proportion of time or right you know, should they be spending on that versus the, the outside mm -hmm. world so i think like um and my friend samuel barnes kind of drew my attention to that like you know don't you know just as a parent questions can become even more um you know pressing and like you know relevant to yourself and like and even even concerning because you're like am I doing the right thing like what's mm. the thing? But, and um I think ultimately though like he, he was just bringing to my attention that this is not like a new problem right parents have always had this issue with uh, is there something that right. a child could be doing rather than other things that they could be doing that that appear or seem to be more concrete or whatever? Mm. And, um, and so I thought that that was helpful for me because it kind of broadened my perspective and didn't and made me feel like kind of less alone in sort of the, yeah. the struggles of like how do you moderate or how should one moderate, mm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that technology technologies are all different. So right. like, yeah. and this is really a point from Neil Postman where he, you know, and, and Marsha McLuhan as well, where you know Ma McLuhan talks a lot about like hot and cold mediums and things like that. Mm. Um but you know we can't treat all technologies alike. You know, no, they're not all the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they all have like their own pros and cons and right. some are better and some are mm. worse and some have you know s some have higher risks or lesser risks yeah and you know one of the things that you know i think you know daniel and i have definitely cons like thought about and considered is the um the fact that like when when children have like this is why i think phones especially at younger ages are mm. really in my opinion not like ideal is because yeah. there's a real kind of golem effect with something you can always hold now right. never mind the fact that like adults have this problem or can have this problem with related to technology as well where it's kind yeah. of this like, golem effect of like it's mine and like it becomes <laughs> a sort of the source of like all ones you know sort of uh you know all one yeah. sort of uh, hope and and mm. and like fun and joy mm -hmm. it all can come from this sort of like one little thing that can be held yeah in. no it's crazy yeah, and, and I mean that's that's like the, the maybe that sounds like an extreme, but you know we have to be honest with ourselves that sometimes these things can take that that sort of role yeah. un, even even unintentionally. Um, that doesn't mean though they should just be like cast out into you know the they can right. they, there just has to be kind of a proper understanding yeah. of different technologies, and yeah. so instead of like being able to use the thing that can be in one's hand as something that can really guide uh, like can really. Um, how should I say this, can really enhance one's, like we were talking in originally, right? There's like these times where you read a book and then you're, it, it somehow actually sure. generates you into deeper connection with the real world. I think yeah. so, so the phone can be the same. Like it can be used, uh, like I think that's why though it's better for, you know, I think adults may have a greater capacity to learn how to discern that. Um, that's right. why for children, it, it's a little trickier and I don't, mm. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable with children having phones yeah. because there's so much suddenly at, at like their access right. and disposal um, where honestly, like it's almost like you don't even know that it's there. You're just as happy to be playing with blocks or like having, having 
you know, Showtime on a TV or something, right. you know what I mean? Where it's yeah. a bit more curated and like you can, it's it's sort of more the sprinkling or like the sprinkling of that versus like the constant, right? Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I, I guess I'm just thinking like with the phone, just to relate to, to the, the inner guide sort of th- concept, I think the phone can be a great source of like um, animating our own creativity and our mm. own creation. And right. I think in that way, it seems like it could be used in a more beneficial manner where like the mm. ultimate reason is for it is to sort of, it, it's not the end all and be all, but it is kind of a, it is a, it's sort of like a, a part of the purpose that you have in a greater capacity, you know? Yeah. So it's, it sort of like becomes a part of, of that. And it's sort of always used in a way to, uh, for the purpose, for the purpose of that purpose, if that makes any mm. sense. I think without purpose or without a sense of, you know, right. creating something, mm. I mean, I'm not saying it cannot be used uh, like in a way that might have a better balance, but I, and even with using it for a purpose, like pe- we can all fall into the, with the technology of the phone for yeah, example. But, yeah yeah but like at least it kind of gives a person a sort of sense of a of what why they are doing what they're right. doing or, what, or kind of what they're trying to build through it mm-hmm. or buy it or you know that they are making connections that are you know really enriching and you know can really like help them to learn more and grow more towards the projects right. that they're working that are not mm-hmm. on the phone or like not related to you know any of the social medias or technologies or mm-hmm. apps there but like it can be a great tool is all I want to say. It's just that no, we have to be aware of how to fuck into this greater inner still small voice, right? Then that's greater than technology. Right. Like you said, that's that's far more powerful. And if, mm-hmm. if I think if it can be used in a way to be in harmony with that, then great. It's when one, like, it's when it starts to become like, the voice itself right like when, right. when the phone becomes like becomes the still small voice itself that that's when it's like oh mm-hmm. wait now i'm becoming its tool not 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 in no yeah sense. so it that was a lot there molly sorry but i just no. wanted to kind of touch thank on all of that so yeah thank you so much it's really interesting um yeah is there any like is there any topic in that which you'd like to get into deeper like i'm just sort of still processing it yeah I guess, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to know, because it's it's often, I, I do have an idea of maybe, like, how can we use these technologies in ways that we, mm-hmm. you know, we don't end up being, like, used, you know, used by it. We're using them. Yeah. But at the same time, like, to me, my thought is purpose, right? Like, have a purpose for it. Right. Yeah. Try, to try, tie, try to tie it into your concrete pen and paper creating that you're doing mm-hmm. or whatever, dance. It doesn't yeah. have to be pen and paper, but, you know. Yeah. So that, but I often think to myself, like, am I just giving myself too much of the benefit of the doubt? Like, mm-hmm. am I just saying that's what it can be used for? But really, yeah, you know, really, it's still kind of a pitfall of, of just sort of a, a golem effect still. So anyways, right. what, what would you, that's maybe what I'm curious yeah. about. I wonder what would you say to that? Because also, sorry, really quick, you touched on this in a post you had recently where you said something, talked about um, maybe social media, like, and how it, how it can be in your life. And, you know, sometimes yeah. that can be like, I think we can all feel it. Um, like sure. there's some great uses for it. Um, but right. it can also be the scrolling or mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. that almost feels sort of addictive in nature. And so, yeah, that yeah. would be my curiosity, Molly. I'd really be interested to yeah, hear your thoughts on of that. Of course. Like, I don't think my thoughts are, like, fully resolved. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, no problem. never, but, you know. Um, but, no, it's like, I first of all, I'd say, like, you know, the fact that you have a narrative around it and like you have a story that you tell yourself which like I'm not saying (laughs) sorry that sounds a little bit um patronizing or something but I'm actually trying to say that having a story for why you're doing something or in other words having a purpose and your your purpose is sort of having a purpose that's (laughs) like it's that's really beneficial because that's a way of engaging authentically with things um is basically understanding why you're doing something and yeah, I think that sounds like a really valid reason. Um, I guess with me, it's like, I like, I'm interested in it. Like, I was kind of like, I was actually kind of dreaming about it last night in relation to our talk, like what you were saying about like concealing and revealing that nature does. Like, it's like with technology, it's kind of like, I feel like there's something harsh about it. Like there's mm. no sheltering. Um, mm. Like, and that's the thing about the children as well. The children. The um, children. <laughs> the children. Protect them. Um, <laughs> um, it's like, I, I don't know. I just like, I feel like I, the first thing that came into my head when you were talking about like whether children should use technology and stuff is like, well, like 
if they're not using it, it needs to be replaced by something. It was the first thing I thought. And then I was kind of trying to imagine what it could be replaced by. And like sort of oral tradition of storytelling or anything like this, it was a way to integrate with care people into the world, you know? Mm -hmm. And what my concern is with technology and specifically social media is that it doesn't have any care. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just like, this is what I like. And it's not about... Like, it's not like, oh, you have to be sh- protective, but like even this idea of sheltering or like mm-hmm. shepherding things, like holding space for things in like uh, in a in a empathetic and meaningful way. So like I sometimes post poems on Instagram and I, and then sometimes I make little books or things. But like I always find like the idea of publishing something, it feels like more of a process where there's a sense of respect for the book, mm-hmm. where somehow like there's like this idea, like I kind of view it metaphysically as this like thing where it's like everything is revealed upon these like sort of like, like this, this, this it's like rather than there being any concealment, it's just like everything is just out there up for grabs. And it's like, <laughs> it's like kind of crude in that way or something. Mm-hmm. And like, and like, but so it's not like a sheltered or like caring place like to place things that are really important to you like that's I like that's my intuition with it anyway and like um so there was something else I was going to say uh, which I've forgotten now um but yeah and then like in terms of my yeah that's all really that's all um just that like somehow like I said oh yeah I remember it's the dating apps like <laughs> I've been on the dating apps and um it's just, tell me more it's Molly so I want to know. it's so ruthless it's just like swiping like you can even share someone else's profile if you want it's just like everything is just up there and there's no for me there's no respect for the individual and like maybe I'm like a traditionalist or something but I was like I was like talking to my mum about this and then she was like we're gonna solve this Molly and I was like ranting about how it's so like it's just that like it's so like it because there's so many people it's it's infinite number of people and it's just showing you everything that like and it's just out there and there's no mystery it's just like it's so harsh to the individual like it's so cruel to people and mm-hmm. um, and then anyway I like I came I was talking to my mom and she found this like dating agency and I was like Dude, that's something that material reality can bring that somehow our structure of the internet can't bring mm-hmm. where basically with the dating agency it's like you have like an interview process then they like interview someone else they have a physical book which without your photo in it where they look through and they like get a sense of what's happening then they like book you a date and like a restaurant but like it wasn't so much any of these particular actions that like were appealing to me it was more like the idea that like somehow somebody cares like there's <laughs> yeah. and there's an amount of there's a sense of ritual there's a sense of care around this and like human the human touch you know what I mean so oh it's my like, gosh, I love that yeah yeah so I was like so that's how I feel about it and then also like like anyone else like I just like if I post something like I just I don't have like a particularly healthy detachment from social media sometimes mm-hmm. so and um, because of this like sometimes I go off and I'm like I'm going to delete it and then I'm like well actually I kind of need this for like my work and and everything so but yeah um so that's my stance on it yeah yeah, yeah, no, that's really good, Molly. And I, I, I appreciate your honesty and sort of sharing just from your own, <laughs> own experience with it. I think there's an amb- ambivalence, but also sort of this, you know, this sort of um, love-hate relationship, I think, but that's not necessarily bad. It, it just means like that we are sometimes in tricky waters because it's also so new as well, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and also it depends on like what, what particular app are we talking about? What particular right. things are we talking about doing on the phone, et cetera. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that uh, it, it, I, I really, I really um, appreciate hearing more too on uh, the dating app topic because <laughs> it's, it's like, it's such a, it's such an, like I was talking with another friend recently, a girl who was express, also expressing some uh, frustrations, real frustration mm. with dating apps and, just um, and then also another friend of mine who I knew from college. I guess I, we and me and Daniel saw him back in May, but he was also expressing um, some right. some frustration. I don't know if it just happens to be the people who I tend to to talk to if they if they have something kind of common to them that mm. I would say there's something is common. It's that they're creatives and you know more philosophical in nature. Right. And I wonder if it's just it makes it very. I wonder if it's just mostly 
and um, for people like that that they might feel a particular dissonance or you know frustration with these apps but honestly you'll see a many types of reels on instagram for example where yeah. people just like you know they'll, they'll be like i you know i deleted the the dating app and like um you know i you know j- just sort of like jo- mm. jokingly about sort of their love-hate relationship with a dating app for example yes, like, sure. they're like you know I, I you know i deleted my like the dating app and now i'm finally happy until like a week later when i put it back <laughs> on again or something you know right, just something right, like right, that right. yeah because they, they really do want to be able to find partnership and connection no, and, of course and and somebody like you know somebody to date or maybe even like get married to one day or something yeah um, but like there's so there's that desire and i i i did this <laughs> i'm always like doing these little recordings that i never post but i hopefully i'll just one day just you know see this is my love-hate relationship like I I want to share things that I create but I also feel like I don't want to impose it's weird it's like because it's not organic I'm not just bumping into somebody at the the cafe or like Mm. it's so much more like I feel like I'm putting myself in people's faces I'm like and and I know that that's not the way people receive it especially my friends because they're like no like we we get such joy out of seeing what each other's creating but it still it still makes me feel like somehow I'm trying to draw attention to myself or like, right. I'm, you know, and yet I do yeah. want to have people like there's a way in which you create because you want people to be able to experience it no, or, or, or see yeah, it or read it or whatever it is. And so yeah. <laughs> it's such a, so this is what I do. I just like do these recordings on anchor, like my individual ones that are sort of, they're, they're kind of like mini monologues about an idea I have and I'll record mm-hmm. it Molly. And then I'll just be like, I'll finish recording it. It's, you know, it's processed and saved, but I'll just be like, Ah, screw it. I'm not going to publish it, you know? Yeah, I know and what I'm you mean. Like, well, why? Because I'm so, it's, yeah. you know, it's like, well, what if it's misunderstood? What if, like, this part doesn't make sense? And and I'm just, you know, it, it makes me frustrated, though, because for me, there's something about that feels very complete in when I do release it. When I actually right. give it to the world or give it to, okay. you know, to friends or, like, the public or whoever our little niche community of people mm. is that are doing this creating and philosophizing, I feel, I feel like, well, I'm so happy I did that. But yeah, I, it, it, because when I just keep it in this little file of all of this stashed up stuff, it still doesn't mm. feel done. It doesn't feel done, even though That's it nice. is. Yeah. Um, and it would be different with different mediums. For some mediums, you would have to stash it away and work at it again and again and again until mm. it's ready, right? But it's like with these little things, I, I feel like there are meant to be impromptu and, you know, thoughts. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know. It's just, it's just sort of, no, that's cool. this it's is my sort of, uh, you know, no. behind the scenes of, of yeah, it. And, of course. and it's, it's just so fascinating, but yeah, anyways, related to this thing, I didn't ever post it was a little bit about like what this friend of ours that we saw in May was saying about um, how he was, he mentioned the very similar things about this crude nature of, and, and rough nature, almost like mm-hmm. inhuman, inhuman nature of dating apps, because there are there are just so many people and such an ability to suddenly like the selective process becomes a lot more about looks and just yeah. um, appeal in that way, which there's a place for that. Don't get me wrong, but it's yeah. like it misses so much of the fullness or the wholeness of the, right. the full person, which is their looks and a lot of other things, you know. Yeah. Um, and so it can be, you know, it can be difficult because yeah. there's this like there's a real sense of I think there can be a lot of sense of fear and paranoia too end up finding someone that they are more attracted to or like you know and and suddenly somebody just gets swiped away and you know there's all these strange sort of even physical phenomenological mechanisms of dealing with profiles and like you know what people can do or just delete or not yeah. respond and like none of this would be like really acceptable social engagement not right, acceptable but right, you know right, what I mean right, in social right. engagement it it would just be so obvious that it's awkward if you if somebody said something and the person just didn't say anything you know (laughs) (laughs) and and yet like that's I know it's a different medium completely so of course we have allowances and understanding for these things you know it's not real phenomenologically shared space communication so it's different and yet though on a psychosomatic level I wonder if our primitive if our primitive side of our aspect of our brain still thinks of it as if it is real communication yeah but it's not physically the same way and so then we get this strange dissonance and it's, it can feel, you know, you have to kind of acknowledge yeah. the limitations it has. So it has a lot of uh, benefits to it. There are a lot of limitations that it does have. And I think the care really quick, the one more thing, the care that you mentioned is really fascinating. And I do think it's sometimes hard to understand like how to, how do I put this? It's like, it's, 
there's e- sometimes there's the nonverbal cues and the other things that people can do for and with each other that sort of show a sense of care that right. now it's reduced to basically ex- explicit communication, right? Yeah. Like, and it's, so it's hard because now we're relying solely on this thing, which is very beneficial and, and useful, but it's, it can't, it's, it, it's also just like, we can't always expect that from each other because obviously too, just life happens, right? But it is a great way to stay in touch and feel the affect of, you know, communing or a relation with the other person. But there's a whole lot more trust communication entails because, you know, you're not able to share the other things that make you feel the care of the person or that they could re- mm. receive or feel your care. And yeah. it's like, you ha- it's like you're left in this sort of funny place of like, you know, you having to kind of leave, there's a lot that's kind of sometimes left in the, I don't know, in the open or like in the silence or something. Yeah. Where you just have to trust that like, yeah, like there's, the relation is not yeah. contingent solely on the expl- explicit yeah. and but it is a part of what developed that relation. Um, mm-hmm. But it's like, you also have to sometimes just rely on the trust of that relationship itself. It exists, even if yeah. it, it's not the, ex- it exists, even right. if there is not the, explicit communication at that time now it, yeah. it, it inevitably happen again probably because of that relation still existing but you so i, I don't know yeah i, don't know I know it's a mumble, mumble of everything but <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, guess, mind. I i guess what i was trying to get at was like what if the very landscape of technology is like a chilly one like what if it's not <laughs> because like people aren't like because if you're in space and there's like a silence like i i don't know i just feel like it it's a it's a careless environment like it's a harsh yeah. environment mm. and like i'm kind of interested in like yeah. the phenomenology of like social media but on technology itself like in a sense like i don't know like i i did a poem before where it was like there was a quote from this um this book w- by this guy called two people cried during o'leary and they said sorry I, i'm just getting on the to now but they said we always knew the future when it arrived would be white and I just feel like it's like there's this white, like white is in like the cold, you know, like the, mm-hmm. the sense the of like, it's like, it's like white walls, like white. I don't know. I just find it interesting. Sorry, it's a bit of a tangent, but just the idea that like maybe somehow there's like a color to technology. Like I find like materializing it in our imagination is like a helpful way to like empower ourselves. Yeah. And like what I was trying to say is that like for me, it feels like this cold, exposed landscape where like, okay, you have like individual relationships with people, of course, in real time. But what if it's like, it usually like, if you send someone a letter and they don't respond for like a few weeks, you're like, oh, it's fine. Like they're just replying to my letter and they're getting their life and the relationship is maintained. But if you, if it's on, if it's on this technological medium, like maybe it's like the landscape itself is so harsh and like so competitive and so like individualistic and identity focused that you start to like, your ego gets in and you're like, oh shit why aren't they replying like maybe they don't like me anymore like and you get paranoid and like everything like that (laughs) so it's like so it's like what if it's not a neutral landscape like I think sometimes Mm. like technology is the most neutral thing it's like it's not it's not neutral like it has all these it's dependent on all these presuppositions it's like it's like a place where they try to get your money it's like owned by like major corporate forces like you get what I'm saying like yeah it's like so so like, anyway holy yes I, i'm like i'm just like cheering inside like yes this is this is uh, i think this is brilliant and it's so important what you're saying okay cool yeah because i like that's kind of like that's my intuition around it like obviously because it's like an intuition you can't be fully like have an example but like i do think in general like even when you have like it's it's helpful to like materialize hmm. in in color in like description what something feels like because then the feeling is externalized like even in terms of like if you have a negative emotion it's like so I'm like sort of trying to do that with my understanding of the internet as well Hmm. how do you feel like that um so I'm gonna ask you one more question just specifically related to that I'll probably have to I'll probably have to wrap it up even though I love love this conversation so much I can talk (laughs) with you for like hours more and we should definitely do another we should definitely get together another time um, to do this if you'd be interested yeah Um, But like, I wonder, what does that mean for you to sort of paint the picture of uh, something that's some engagement or some type of thing you're doing online? Like, uh, do you do do that more so with people you're interacting with through the phone? Or is it like just anything you do? What might that look like um, for yourself and painting a picture of of 
well uh, yeah like so something's coming to mind for what I'm what mm. I do sometimes but yeah tell me what you do because I'd be curious to like hear more about that okay sorry the way that I'm sort of cons- trying to materialize what it's like phenomenologically and stuff yeah yeah in my mind is, is that what you're asking how do I yeah. how does that actually um, manifest yep, yeah yeah I'm yeah, no, I guess it's just, it's like, it's not like my um, raison d'etre or anything. It's just like, it's like, I, but I guess it has been like a topic that I've explored, like through poems, mm-hmm. which, yeah, I guess I have like, and like also, uh, yeah, I guess I have like published on or like pu- pu- put on the internet. Um, but, but yeah, I guess it's just like, it, it's probably, to me, it feels like an ongoing interest that's like bubbling that like, maybe we'll materialize in different forms like going forward you know um but like I don't know if there's been I don't I don't think it's resolved yet I think it's like something maybe like in its infancy you know yeah yeah a lot of times I think like that's on that sounds really interesting and I'm definitely you know it's definitely a topic of interest for myself as well but it's kind of funny Molly because I don't know maybe somebody could just call it like oh well that's just your imagination like to, to right. do something but like it's funny like even as we're talking I know it seems strange but like I've I've kind of envisioned us like sitting at a, like sitting with tea <laughs> at a table <laughs> of tea together oh, talking geez. with each other and it's I know yeah. that's funny because like yeah we're not actually in the same physical space Molly right. but there's something about just even envisioning that that like and I don't know if it's just the fact that I'm enjoying the conversation so much that it feels cozy. It feels, it feels, <laughs> it doesn't feel sterile. You know, it feels the right. opposite. It feels like yeah. intimate and in- engaging. So it's like, I, I, because of that, it makes me kind of paint something that isn't just what our physical spaces are right now, or like the sterile, you know, vacuum of the internet, whatever that is, you know, the sort of yeah. like exposed, like you're saying, and I think those are great descriptors for you know, what this landscape potentially is and what we're trying to actually work with. Um, but yeah. yeah, it's like if I, there's something about the specificity of, even if it's like a complete illusion, like or like it's a complete <laughs> image of that I just fabricated in my head of us right. sitting and talking with tea, it still yeah. somehow gives some sense of like us actually having engagement with each other that yeah. is uh, not just sort of like sound bites, you know? <laughs> Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I'm like, okay, I know we have to finish up, but I was just gonna say, like, yeah, I, no, I really believe in the power of the imagination. Like, I don't think mm-hmm. the imagination is something, you know, f- futile. Like, I think it's like really deeply connected with our spirit. I'm like with the spirit of the world. That's the first thing I'd say. But also, it reminds me of like, um, I I read this. Oh, I wish I could find the book. But like, anyway, like <laughs> around this time, like. That during lockdown my sister was like in a landlocked place and we've always grown up beside the sea and she was like dreaming of the sea and it was like her body was like visualizing like how, how I understood it it was like her body was like doing this almost anchoring like to like w- what was home for her because she felt like she couldn't reach that you know so her imagination was bringing her home but like and then at around the same time I was like reading about these little Sorry, <laughs> like how would I describe this? But these little um, slugs um, mm. that that orientate themselves to the moon. And um, anyway, there was just like a line, and it was like um, it was like a, it was like written by a scientist, but it, she it was a very poetic writer, and she was like, um, "Oh my god, if I, I I maybe can find it somewhere, but I'm just going to give you a version of it, which was pretty much she was like, and he remembers in every fiber of his little green bo- body the distant call of the great sea and it's because he orientates himself in relation to the tides and even mm. though it's this tiny little life form like it has an imagination and it's like Im- it's imagining the landscape and like mm. orientating itself towards that and I don't know I just it was just like I just remember that realization and like that connection with my sister and now you speaking about like us having a cup of tea like I don't think that's like mere imagination or silly or something I think it's like it's really valuable especially if you're alienated it's like a survival ca- capacity like especially because we can't see each other and maybe it feels weird that we can't like to use your imagination to ground yourself is like really valuable you know yeah <laughs> no, I love that I love that no that was so good I love that so much and I appreciate you saying that because it it makes me feel like not that I I, I value the imagination too so I, it's I don't know why I would just sort of dismiss it but I 
as silly or something like that. But it, it's, it's, you know, to me, that was really helpful because it's, it's like, no, no, that's actually part of grounding yourself. And there's something very real about what you're imagining to right. give yourself a bearing, so, you know, to give yourself sure. a sort of situated sense of place with this person you're speaking with. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I do think the imagination is, is powerful. And, you know, it's another topic to hopefully talk with you about sometime. some of yeah. the things that, questions that come to mind on imagination. But yeah, I've loved I'll, this so much, Molly. It's been thank so you. great. Thank you so much. And I'll find that quote for you because I like completely butchered it. So I like the slugs. <laughs> oh, no, it's so, so adorable and like amazing. So I love little like creatures and, and learning about that sort of thing, too. So, yeah, please send it to me and I can. Yeah, yeah I'm, really, I'm really happy we're able to do this, Molly. And I, I look forward to being able to talk with you again soon. And yeah, I yeah. hope that you have a very good evening and that you feel better soon, too. Okay, thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. Okay, bye, bye, bye. Thanks, Molly. Bye, bye. Bye.